Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. I am Rondell Donoa, and I am your host, and I'm so happy for you to join us today as we discuss a very, very, very important topic, the Privy Council. Uh, just a bit of an overview. Now, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is the final court of appeal for many current and former Commonwealth countries. Um, they have retained the right to appeal, and Trinidad and Tobago is no exception. Now, there have been many discussions and debates as to whether or not we should abolish the Privy Council as the final court of appeal. Of course, we have the advent of the Caribbean Court of Justice, which was basically established in 2001 and began operations in Trinidad on, uh, in 2005. Now, we have four of 11 countries in the CARICOM which have joined the CCG, and unfortunately, Trinidad and Tobago isn't one. Many people ask the question, do we really need the Privy Council? Now, with me, I have the esteemed privilege of joining me at, via the web, Queen's Council, Mr. Anand Biharilal. Of course, before I introduce him, I would just like to give you a very brief overview of who Council Biharilal is. Queen's Council, he is a member of the Bar of Trinidad and Tobago. He has Trinidad and Tobago heritage and England and Wales. He's also a highly experienced attorney who, is, who has instructed to lead both criminal and civil cases. He practices in Trinidad and Tobago in both criminal and civil cases. He's also regularly instructed in advisory and appellant work before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in both criminal and civil appeals from Trinidad and Tobago and other Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions. And of course, Mr. Biharilal is an alumni of St. Benedict's College, a college which I proudly, proudly hold because I am also a past student there. That's just a side note. So, Senior Queen's Council, good morning. And how are good you? Good morning. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you. Ronald, nice to see you. Good, good. How is the weather in, in the UK? Uh, it's actually quite grey and rainy today. I, I, we need some Caribbean sun. As usual. <laughs> well, actually, today is very rainy. So we, we are working very um, telepathically. <laughs> so we are discussing the Privy Council. Can you tell yeah. our viewers, what is the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council? Well, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, more commonly simply called the Privy Council, um, pretty much everywhere in the Caribbean and even here, is uh, the final court in the three-tier court system. So in Trinidad and Tobago, like in England, you have the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and then above it, a final appellate court, which is the Privy Council. Yeah. It deals with the final determination of law on the cases that come before it, whether criminal or civil. And what is the procedure for bringing an appeal um, to the Privy Council from Trinidad and Tobago? Many people may ask. Right. From Trinidad and Tobago, if it's a civil matter, then you generally have a right of appeal if the uh, financial threshold is met. I think it's still $1,500. So you simply indicate that I've had a final determination of my case by the High Court, by the Court of Appeal, and I now wish to exercise my right to appeal to the Privy Council. Yes. And as long as your appeal is not frivolous or vexatious, in other words, it raises a genuine point of dispute, then you have a right to ask the Court of Appeal to grant you permission to appeal to the Privy Council. And, does, a, and is it an automatic right? or, or, or It is, it is essentially automatic, subject, is, of course, to what I say, if your appeal is frivolous or vexatious, so let's say you're just doing it for delay tactics, uh, then that wouldn't be a proper use of the right of appeal. Yes. And in criminal cases, there is no right of appeal from Trinidad and Tobago. You have to petition the... Privy Council directly. So you lodge an application saying, can I have permission to appeal? And if they say yes, then you go ahead with your appeal. If they say no, then that's the end of it. And how many justices does the uh, Privy Council consist of? The Privy Council usually sits with a quorum of, of five judges. Yes. Uh, and so these are the five most senior judges uh, in England, but also in the Commonwealth, because many of them have practiced in jurisdictions in the Caribbean, and sometimes in America, Canada, and so forth. Uh, in the main, of course, they have practiced in England because they're drawn from the English bar. But increasingly now, and it's something that's not very well known and perhaps should be well known, 
senior Commonwealth judges can also sit in the Privy Council. Okay. Um, and the uh, former Chief Justice, Chief Justice de la Bastide, was one of the last from Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, de la Bastide. Okay. To sit. That is that is that is very interesting. And basically, a lot of persons think that the priv that uh, 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 the petitioning to the Privy Council, Privy Council, sorry, is a very expensive process. Uh, what do you say about that <laughs> as, a, well, as a QC? Sure. Well, um, I think we're, it's, it's apt that we're talking about this now because so much has changed with the implications of COVID-19, but digitization generally. COVID-19 has simply pulled us forward in time to now dealing with things electronically. So the old days of drafting lengthy documents, printing them out and sending them by special delivery to England, those days are now coming to an end, and I would say have come to an end, because everything now is done electronically. So the cost saving there is um, quite, quite, quite large. But as you will know, Rondell, as a fellow lawyer, not just a fellow alumni from uh, St. Benedict's College, yes. <laughs> um, very often it's the lawyers, the cost of legal fees that is cost restricted. And one of the things that um, I, I has come to my attention, and you may know yourself, is that the more senior the lawyer you go to, the more costly it may be. And of course, and in Trinidad and Tobago, senior counsel will charge more than junior counsel, yes. as you know. Um, but in terms of cost, the real cost is actually the lawyer you retain, not so much the filing fees and so on. So depending on who you instruct, that's what dictates how expensive or how cheap bringing an appeal may be. Like yourself. <laughs> well, uh, expensive or cheap. I don't know which one you're talking about. Well, expensive. I, like I mean, you pay for experience. I'm, uh, cost, I'm, I, I am cost efficient. Cost efficient. I, I, I agree with that, uh, having experience myself. Um, now, how does the Privy Council perceive us as, as a small island with many, many judicial issues? Of course, having yourself appeared before the Judicial Committee on many, many occasions. How do, they, how do they perceive us and the way uh, the, the, courts, uh, the courts basically uh, deal with matters in our jurisdiction? Um, the, well, the Privy Council views the Court of Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago and the High Court of Trinidad and Tobago exactly the same way as it would view the Court of Appeal of England or the High Court of England. These are important uh, Supreme Courts in their own right. And the Privy Council generally gives deference to the way in which the local courts have dealt with a particular point. Yes. And so in many cases, they have said that they take into account local practice, local custom, and the knowledge of local judges. And due deference is given to that in the judgments that the Privy Council has given over many years. However, this is subject to an important exception. No matter what deference you may give, for those types of considerations, the primary duty of the Privy Council is to uphold the rule of law and its correct interpretation and application. And after you make those allowances, if it is clear that an error of law has been made, the Privy Council will almost certainly correct it, whether that means uh, the appeal is allowed or whether the appeal is dismissed subject to that correction of the error concern. Yes. The important thing is this, the Privy Council is concerned with the proper application of the law in Trinidad and Tobago. And importantly, and, and this I think is something that's often misunderstood, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is not a foreign court. It mm -hmm. is a Trinidadian court, yes. a Tobagonian court, or when it sits for Jamaica, a Jamaican court. It does not, um, you cannot, if you're in England, appeal to the Privy Council. It is a foreign court in England. Yes. It is a local court for the states that retain it as their final court. And that's very important to very understand. Important. And, and a lot of persons perceive that um, the judiciary or the Privy Council can create law. Can they? They can just pronounce on, 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 the, on, the, on the law, not so? It, 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 that is right. But um, you see, there is something called parliamentary sovereignty. And Trinidad and Tobago, since uh, the early 1960s, is a sovereign independent nation, which has the ability to pass its own laws. Once Parliament passes laws in accordance with the Constitution, those laws are valid, subject, of course, to the Constitution 
of Trinidad and Tobago, which has a safety provision in relation to striking down laws if it is deemed unconstitutional. The Privy Council does not make law in the sense of they suddenly legislate for Trinidad and Tobago, but what they do is they look at the application of the law to make sure that as the laws have been passed in Trinidad and Tobago, they are applied correctly. I know we've touched, we've touched on a point of unconstitutionality. Sure. Uh, now, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm varying a lot to another, to another aspect. Of course. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is one of the very few countries that, um, that still retains the mandatory death penalty. And as we are all aware, well, at least the legal luminaries, that the Privy Council in 1993 case of um, Pratt and the Attorney General of Jamaica would have deemed um, death, death by hanging unconstitutional. Now, Trinidad and Tobago still have that uh, part of the legislation, actually pa mandatory death, still part of the legislation. Now, how does that work in tandem with the Privy Council's pronouncement that it is unconstitutional? Right. Well, um, this is something that has exercised many of the uh, interviews I've given over the years and opinions I've written uh, in relation to criminal cases involving the death penalty. Yes. First of all, the Platt and Morgan decision has been misunderstood. And um, I want to, I I'll spend a little time on this because I think it's important to correct it. First and foremost, Pratt and Morgan did not decide that the death penalty was unconstitutional. What it decided is that after you have convicted someone of murder and sentenced them to death, you cannot then have them delayed within the legal system for more than five years and 10 years and 11 years and 20 years and then decide to execute them. Because as you know, Ronda, as a fellow attorney, Part and parcel of a sentencing is to punish, to deter, and to rehabilitate. Yes. When you pass the death penalty, you're not going to rehabilitate. You are saying this is only punishment and deterrence. Yes. Rehabilitation comes with the length of time you serve in prison. And that is the element that the Privy Council said, well, hang on a minute. For those states who retain the death penalty, if you are going to hang people, hang them quicker and within five years of the sentence being imposed. Mm -hmm. Now, the way in which many politicians have taken that, they have not looked at the case. They've not looked at that reality from the case. And they've said, mm -hmm. well, actually, the Privy Council telling us, go hang nobody. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Yes. What it is saying is saying those states who wish to have the death penalty, that is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. But from a constitutional rights perspective, which is enshrined, in the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, you cannot subject people to cruel and inhuman and degrading treatment. And if you are saying to somebody, I'm going to take your life, then you must do so immediately. And the Privy Council said, even though it's immediately, we're going to give you five years. But what you cannot do is then have them hanging around, figuratively speaking, in prison for more than five years and then crossing 10 years and not carry out the death penalty. Because then the person who has been sentenced to death rehabilitates. They change yes. over that period of time. And you have to make allowance for that in any legal system. But and you, so actually, yes. as I say, the Privy Council is, is not saying uh, the death penalty is wrong. It's simply saying, if you're going to carry it out, do it quickly. QC, just hold on a bit. We will be back after the break. You're watching sure. Strictly Legal on WESN. And welcome back. And with me, is Mr. Anand Biharilal, Queen's Counsel, Barrister for England and Wales, and attorney at law in Trinidad and Tobago. Senior, so we were speaking about the delay in terms of, okay, you can't, con you can't hang someone uh, after five years, at least the Privy Council is stating that that is unconstitutional. Now, do you think the reason why there's a delay of five years is because of the fact that the, the uh, convicted person is appealing his conviction? It, it's, it's not that, in fact. You see, 
Every system that has an appeal process has time limits. And what has to happen in the local judiciary, so this is between the High Court and the Court of Appeal, is to ensure that anybody who is appealing, their appeal is heard within one year. And then if they are going to appeal to the Privy Council, that they do so immediately, and that, they, that that is resolved within one year. And I'm using that as an average figure, mm -hmm. because that means it's two years between conviction and final determination of the appeals process. Yes. And if you ask for expedition, you should be able to get it in Trinidad and Tobago before the Court of Appeal. Yeah. You would certainly get it if you ask for expedition mm -hmm. uh, in the Privy Council, because if they know somebody's going to be executed, it, uh, uh, until they make a determination, they will almost certainly give you an expedited hearing. Yeah. So what I cannot understand is why in Trinidad and Tobago, the appeals process takes so long. Mm -hmm. Because if it didn't, and we've seen the example with Doe Cheney, you may remember, yes. his appeals were completed within the five-year process, and he and his cohorts were executed within time, on time. Yes. So there was no constitutional violation there. Yeah. And Remember, Dolce, he appealed to the Privy Council, and it was dismissed. They didn't stop the state of Trinidad from executing him. And what appears to have happened in Trinidad and Tobago generally is that there appears to be an unofficial moratorium on executions. Why that is, I don't know. Is it because it, of public pressure? Is it because of public pressure? Or, 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 or I, I, I don't actually know, because the public seems to still support, support. the death penalty, yes, correct. particularly after recent events with... Uh, Andrea Barrett yes. and, uh, and so forth. Yes. And one would expect that those cases should be given priority in terms of charge, in terms of prosecution, in terms of appeals, that the entire process is completed within five years. Five years. And if I may uh, touch on another uh, uh, related aspect of that, I know that our current commissioner, Gary Goodless, is trying to try a new methodology in so many different ways to try and reform the police service and the way in which cases are investigated and charged. But I also note with some degree of sadness that very recently he'd said that they have to park the training of police prosecutors because they just don't have a budget for it. Now, this something, Rondell, is indicative of the problem, yes, specifically with criminal justice. Yes. We need, as you know, a active police service that deals with every aspect of policing, including the police prosecution arm, mm -hmm. and a DPP's office that has a lawyer assigned immediately to every murder case that is progressed and processed through the courts as swiftly as possible. Yes. And we need more judges in the high court that are able to sit to hear these cases, and perhaps more judges in the court of appeal yeah. to make sure these cases go through. And unless and until we have that investment, I fear that the delays will continue. But these are remedied and remedial at the local level. It's got nothing to do with the Privy Council. This is investment needed in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Senior, the CCJ, a lot of yes. persons are clamoring for Caribbean integration for the CCJ, that's the Caribbean Court of Justice, yes. to become the final court of appeal. And many persons, are, of course, have the conception that, or misconception maybe, according to how they view it, that the Privy Council, a foreign institution should not be adjudicating on behalf of the citizens. Do you think that we really still need a Privy Council? Or can we now convert to the Caribbean Court of Justice as Guyana, Belize, Barbados have done? Uh, I think it's a very um, complex, it's a simple question to ask, but the answer is very complex. Uh, 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 and we have limited time to talk yes. about it on your, on your program. But I think one of the important things is this, and it's important to remember. When Trinidad and Tobago was piloted to independence, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council was specifically included in the, in the new constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. The government that uh, was in power for many, many years, right up to 1986, including when Trinidad and Tobago became a republic in the 1970s, had every opportunity, if it wished, to remove the Judicial Committee and say, look, we want the Privy Council no longer to adjudicate in these matters. But they took the conscious decision to leave the Judicial Committee as the final appellate court. And when one looks at the various events, which are nothing to do with the law, but are to do with 
society and politics and so on generally, one can see why the Privy Council has been retained. Because currently in Trinidad and Tobago, the vast majority of the public have a lack of confidence in many of the public institutions. Do you think the judiciary Trinidad as well? Do you think the judiciary is also part of that lack of public confidence? That I, I'd like, I, I wish to believe it is not. Right. But when I look at, for example, recent cases like Mirage versus the Attorney General in relation to the judicial and legal services composition, why was it necessary to have to go to the Privy Council to say that five members of this panel have to be appointed and they can't include certain people. That should have been something that could have been determined in Trinidad and Tobago without the Privy Council's intervention. And so when you ask the question, does it include the judiciary? It's very difficult to answer, but certainly there's a public perception about every public institution, perhaps even including the judiciary, that everything is not as it should be. Now, we need to bolster the public's confidence in it. We need these institutions to be more efficient. And coming back to criminal justice, if those minor changes were made to make the criminal justice system more efficient, I think it would give the public the confidence to say, our institutions are working as they should, and therefore, now we can look at the Privy Council. It's kind of like, Rondo, yes. you have a house with three floors. The first floor, needs new windows, needs new furniture, needs maintenance. The second floor just needs a little refurbishment, but the top floor is the penthouse and has everything which is brand new and brilliant. And then the person who is responsible for maintaining the house says, you know what, instead of fixing the, 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 the ground floor, the first floor, let us change the top floor first mm. before we do any of the rem remedial repairs needed below. And, and, and that doesn't make any sense. Right. right now, the Privy Council fulfills all of the functions it needs. But senior, but, but senior, but one can argue that the, the Caribbean Court of Justice is, uh, of, is composed of judges from various jurisdictions. So therefore, one can argue that there's no prejudice to a party who is appealing, as, or who is using the CCG as a final court of appeal, because it could be the same procedure or the same composition of persons or independent persons as the, as the law lords of the, um, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Well, one could certainly argue that, but then when one looks at the empirical evidence that we have, the same arguments have been made in Trinidad and Tobago, and there's that you don't have the support for that change to be made. The same argument has been made in Grenada twice, 2016 and 2018, put to a referendum and the people of Grenada rejected it. They don't want the CCJ, they want the Privy Council. The same thing has happened in Antigua Barbuda, and they too have rejected the replacement of the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. So yes, I think there are arguments both ways, but when we look at the position of various states of Trinidad and Tobago, there is also a very powerful view that um, they do not yet feel that it is right to remove the Privy Council, rather they wish to retain it. So what and about they wish to retain it for a very good reason? So senior, what about the uh, gradual uh, coming on of this of the Caribbean Court of Justice? So, so maybe certain cases, um, whether it is in a civil jurisdiction or the or the or the criminal, um, can now be heard in the CCG. So we can probably test the waters and see how it goes. Well, I think um, it's difficult. You, I don't think you can have. I think it would be a recipe for disaster to have appeals to the CCJ from Trinidad and Tobago and the Privy Council running in parallel. I do think that whatever decision is made, it must be decisive and it must be clear because that is how you give confidence and finality to the process. If you have appeals running in parallel, there's a very real risk that people will engage in the analysis of which judgment is better. And that may not bode well for public confidence in the future. If and when a decision is made to remove the Privy Council as a final court of appeal for any Caribbean state, like Barbados, like Guyana, like Belize, it has to be done decisively. And, what, and it, it won't inspire any confidence if you have them running in parallel. And in your opinion, how do you think that that can be achieved? I know you have said it before, but how do you think, in your opinion, that can be achieved and whether I, it is achievable? I, 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 I come back to what I said a moment ago. Okay. I think that what is needed right now is a heavy investment and bolstering 
in the public institutions of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly criminal justice, but also a greater transparency with the process of appointments to the High Court, to the Court of Appeal, that complaints like resulted in the Privy Council having to adjudicate on the JLSE's uh, membership, things like that should not happen. And it's going to take many years, I suspect, for that to uh, be rectified. And I should also uh, remind you, Rondo, that there have been some tremendous injustices, even to members of our own profession, uh, 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 at the hands of the uh, historic courts of Trinidad and Tobago. You know the story of Ramesh Maharaj. Yes. I think it should be required reading for many attorneys. Yes. And In his own country, before his own courts, mm -hmm. he ended up having to serve seven days in prison, mm -hmm. and only to be vindicated by the Privy Council. And um, uh, I think that uh, most young lawyers and those who are thinking about removing the Privy Council uh, uh, should read that book. And I think I've, I've still got a copy of it here. Required reading. Yes. Well, the young Ramesh. And I think if you do that, it would inform the approach that might be taken in the future. And Queen's Council, in wrapping up, will you support the abolition of the Privy Council as the final court of appeal? I, I have to say that um, I am one of the lobby of Trinidad and Tobago lawyers that does not feel that this is the right time to remove the Privy Council as the final appellate court. I think it still has very important work to do. But I am not close to the possibility that in the future, uh, the circumstances may change, that we may have to look at this issue again. We have, there we have it. Uh... Mr. Anand Bihari Lal, Queen's Counsel, Barrister, and Attorney at Law, both in Toronto, Tobago, and England, Wales. Queen's Counsel, I thank you so much for agreeing to join us and giving of your most human expertise and opinions on this matter. And I do hope that maybe I can call upon you again as a follow up to this conversation. Of course. Nice to see you, Rondo. And a lot, of, a lot of law students as well are listening to you, and they have been very much admirable of you. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I hope it's been informative and helpful to them. Indeed. Thank you so much. So, guys, Trinidad and Tobago and the world, there you have it. You have been watching WESN Strictly Legal. I am Rhonda Donoa. See you next time for another episode. Have a good day.